from the American Bar Association Law Museum in Chicago, the section of Antitrust Law presents the Oral History Project, interviews with the leaders who have made significant contributions to antitrust law practice. Ninth Circuit to the contrary notwithstanding. <laughs> Judge Easterbrook, uh, we are delighted that you're here to participate in the ABA section of Antitrust Law Oral History Project. Happy to be here. And I, I know you've got many things to do, uh, but hopefully we'll benefit from your insight and uh, I will do my best to be as inoffensive as possible. <laughs> oh, being offensive is important. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to find the beginning uh, where we can start. Uh, when did you experience first intersect with antitrust? Was there, was there something that captured you or someone who captured you? Well, when I was an undergraduate, yeah, I majored in both economics and political science and thought I would go to law school because that was a, a wonderful way to see the effect on the entire American society of some of the principles I'd been studying. Uh, and you, you arrive at law school and in the days before Richard Posner published Economic Analysis of Law, the general view is that economics is best used to study explicit markets. Mm -hmm. And that meant antitrust, it may have meant corporate and securities law, and it, this is of course something that Ronald Coase still thinks mm -hmm. that economic analysis should be limited to explicit markets. But people who arrived uh, in law school in my time and were interested in economic analysis of law never thought of economics as a suitable way to study the family or criminal procedure or torts or contracts uh, and ended up being drawn to antitrust. The boundaries of economic analysis have expanded a lot since, but that's what first uh, got my interest in, in antitrust. That's really where the economic analysis of law movement began. What role did professors at the University of Chicago and your fellow students play? The professors you had, say, at the University of Chicago. Oh, they tried to talk people out of it. Uh, when I was a, a law student, the professor of antitrust was Phil Neal, who was then the dean of the University of Chicago. And he may have been the professor of antitrust law at the University of Chicago, but he was not a member of the Chicago School of Antitrust. Mm -hmm. He had recently been the chairman of a committee that published a report that was very much along the lines of the, the Harvard School of Antitrust and was concerned about aggregate size in the economy. Uh, and Professor Neal was, was interested in a much more traditional approach to antitrust. I think Chicago was slowly winning him over mm -hmm. at the time. It was interesting that one could become dean of the University of Chicago without really being a member of the Chicago School. Mm -hmm. your, your class at the U of C had several individuals who went on to achieve antitrust prominence, uh, Marius Quinaga, Ron Carr, and yes, Doug Ginsburg also. Uh, and uh, there are some other classes and other schools that have that same phenomenon. How does that happen? I mean, was there something, did you all know that this was something that interested you? I think all of us knew this was a subject of interest, but it's also the case that those interests can reinforce. Mm -hmm. you, you learn a lot more at, in the library, in the corridors, talking to one another than you, mm -hmm. you learn in class. Uh, another person uh, who took uh, Professor Neal's antitrust class was Hal Scott, who has taught mm -hmm. antitrust mm -hmm. at Harvard. Uh, Hal was a year ahead of those you've already mentioned. Uh, and we spent a lot of time talking about these matters outside of class, and it reinforced our interest inside of mm -hmm. class. And what was your perception of the law at, the, at this early stage of your career? <sighs> I've never tried to figure out where the law is going. <laughs> But remember, this is the, the early 70s. It was a few years after Schwinn and mm -hmm. Pabst and Vons Grocery mm -hmm. and Brown Shoe. The, the Brown Shoe case was much too much, uh, even for Professor Neal, mm -hmm. uh, who was absolutely withering in his critique of the idea that you could condemn a merger, a tiny vertical merger, just because the defendants had said, well, you know, we're not really doing anything here that will affect competitors because we're not achieving any efficiencies. And the Supreme Court in Brown Shoes says, ah, well, if you achieve efficiencies, you're driving out rivals and that's bad. And if you don't achieve efficiencies, then there's no purpose for the merger and that's bad. Uh, 
when you've got an antitrust law that gets people coming and going, one can ask whether this is just not an anti-business program. And an anti-business program is, in the end, an anti-consumer program. Mm -hmm. So there, that was the state of things. And nobody believed, not Professor Neal, and certainly not those people in his class, nobody believed that that could endure for very long. And of course it didn't. At some point did you come to understand that the interaction of law and economics uh, was essential to arrive at the right decision in an antitrust case? Absolutely. Decisions in the antitrust field or almost any other, it's much easier for law to injure consumers than it is to help them. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether, whether or not the world looks like Adam Smith's world of atomistic competition and little pin makers and price exactly equaling marginal cost surely doesn't look like mm -hmm. that. Uh, it is a lot easier for law to drive prices up than it is to drive prices down. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier for law to prohibit new and interesting products and new and interesting distribution arrangements than it is for law to come up with new ones that benefit consumers. Okay, the, the errors of the market tend to get wiped out by competition. That was Adam Smith's great mm -hmm. insight uh, and something I think that's been proved many times over. But the errors of the legal system well, there isn't any automatic market mechanism to get rid of them. And of course the legal system takes people who do things otherwise and puts them in jail. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have errors in the world, the legal system, businessmen, even, heaven forfend, federal judges make large numbers of errors. You want a system in which the errors are self-correcting or correcting by the market or mm -hmm. private choices, rather than one where you need long pleas to Congress or something else to get a change. So while you're in law school in the corridors, you're having this discussion, these types of discussions with colleagues. At that time, did you have any confidence that uh, the bench and the bar would be up to the task? Well, it depends on what task they're, they're up to. It was clear, uh, if you just look back at the dissents Justice Stewart and Justice Harlan were writing at the time, it was clear that some people appreciated that it was easier to misuse law than to use law correctly. Uh, and it was clear that there was some undercurrent of unease in the judiciary with what could be described as the inhospitality tradition of antitrust. That's how Don Turner once mm -hmm. described it. If you look at a practice you don't understand, well, it could be bad, could be good, it's safer to condemn it. There was, a, there was a current of unease with the idea of condemning things you don't understand. First, because legal processes don't correct themselves very well. And second, because of the great work that was done by Ronald Coase and the many people he got to write for the Journal of Law and Economics, going back and analyzing one antitrust case after another that had been decided on, this, on the basis of this inhospitality uh, tradition and finding that, in fact, uh, the judges had misunderstood the practice and had probably condemned something that was beneficial or at least harmless. And if it wasn't harmless, it was going to go away by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and once that unease with this inhospitality tradition becomes widespread, it's, it's a tradition that really can't stand up mm -hmm. and, as we now observe, did not stand up. You conclude that antitrust cases were often wrongly decided or that the analysis was not at all clear? Well, they were certainly wrongly decided. Anybody who read the Journal of Law and Economics uh, with any care would observe how many of them were wrongly decided. And even, even then, the late 60s and early 70s, the law review literature outside the Journal of Law and Economics was just filled with analyses mm -hmm. suggesting that there were problems in individual cases. Nobody could understand it to think about a case from uh, 1967, Schwinn, why the ancient rule against restraints on alienation had anything to do with antitrust law. Mm -hmm. and nobody could understand why the membership practices of the New York Stock Exchange were related to antitrust law. None of these seemed to be mm -hmm. closely connected to consumers' welfare. So obviously there was uh, a lot of belief that these cases were wrongly decided. The question is what what happens? How far are these principles going to, going to extend before they can go away? The, 
antitrust had developed as a form of common law. Uh, ever, you know, ever since President Taft, in his early incarnation as a judge of the Sixth Circuit, had said in the Addiston Pipe case that what the Sherman Act does is allow the federal courts to make up a common law of restraint of trade. Ever since then, people knew that rules could be unmade in the judicial process, just as they had been made in the judicial process. But I don't think we had then, and we surely do not have now, a general theory for when uh, the common law will change and how it will change. There's a large degree of influence of who the particular people are on the court, a large degree of influence of the professorate, uh, both directly and through their influence on members of the bar. There's a large degree of influence from Congress, from the economy, and how all of that gets together into a common law, we, we don't have a good theory of that. Is it left only to the Supreme Court to uh, explicate the development of the common law? Well, and I've already mentioned the fact that uh, Judge Taft, as he was then, made yeah. this major advance when he was on the Sixth Circuit. Yeah. So, no, it's not left only to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court can operate, mm -hmm. and the U.S. Courts of Appeals can operate, only against the background of the law as it is. There's nothing that any judge can do that is fundamentally at odds with the political temper of the times, because then what they do won't last very long. What brought you to the Solicitor General's office? Doesn't everybody want to see how courts work? I mean, I, the opportunity to see courts work from the inside is, was irresistible to me and most of my friends in law school. You go to law school for three years, uh, and the work of class consists largely in reading opinions, and then in the professors telling you why the judges who wrote those opinions were brain damaged. Uh, you would love to see how this works from the inside, uh, and of course many of us would love to see whether we could do it better ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took my chance to become a law clerk, uh, and then I took even more quickly the chance when it came to uh, go to work for Bob Bork, who was then the Solicitor General, uh, and see how the process worked at the Supreme Court mm -hmm. from a different perspective. Was it Bob Bork's reputation that brought you to the SG's office? It was the reputation of the office. Uh, at the time, Bork's reputation in antitrust was not what it is now. He had published a few articles. He was working on the antitrust paradox, but he hadn't published it. He actually had a manuscript that he put in his pocket and held while he was in the Solicitor General's office. Uh, but Bob Bork and Ward Bowman, his colleague at Yale at the time, had, had published a few pieces. And they, they, Yale, in the 60s and early 70s, was the real home of the Chicago School of Antitrust. The Chicago approach was being taken at Yale, and the Harvard approach was being taken at Chicago. It's all very complicated. <laughs> uh, but the, the main reason I applied is because I wanted to see how the Supreme Court worked. I wanted to try my hand as an advocate. I had thought in my career I wanted to be an advocate, a scholar, and a judge. If I could manage all three of those things uh, at some time, uh, and being in the Solicitor General's office gave you an opportunity to see one court close up mm -hmm. and to play the role of advocate. So I just sent a letter. Nothing, no inside news, no invitation. I, I sent in a letter uh, and was surprised to get a letter back inviting me for an interview. Obviously, some of my friends on the faculty at Chicago had put in a good word uh, with the Chicago School of Antitrust, <laughs> who was then the Solicitor General. <laughs> While you were at the SG's office, did you argue any antitrust cases? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, not my first... Good ones? Not my first three years. Uh, it took a while to rise in seniority. The, the early years, uh, the antitrust cases were being argued by Dan Friedman, Mm -hmm. uh, who had been arguing antitrust cases on behalf of the United States since time uh, immemorial, it seemed, to a very young person, but, but in fact only for 20 or 25 years. And when Dan became the chief judge of what was then called the Court of Claims, mm -hmm. now the Federal Circuit, uh, I was appointed Deputy Solicitor General with the Economic and Antitrust Portfolio, uh, and that gave me an opportunity to, to argue a few antitrust cases as well as do the briefs in a few. Uh, the 
probably the best known antitrust case that I argued while I was in the Solicitor General's office was broadcast music against mm -hmm. CBS dealing with the, the music industry's blanket license, mm -hmm. which the Second Circuit had held to be a per se violation of the antitrust laws. And the Supreme Court unanimously said you can't use the per se rule unless you really understand the practice. And the, the broadcast music case was, uh, on my reading, perhaps the death blow for the inhospitality tradition of antitrust. It had suffered some real blows in 77, but in 79, by 79, it was over. When you talk about understanding the practice, are we talking about understanding the economics of the practice, or are we talking about understanding the nitty-gritty facts that you might have coming out in a, in a, in a trial Understanding court? the economic consequences of the practice. Mm -hmm. All too many antitrust trials were, and alas, still are, uh, about seeing if you can find a memo in which the managers say, we will crush the competition, mm -hmm. grind him up and drink him for breakfast, or something like that. Uh, but what that desire is, of course, completely consistent with welfare to consumers. That's what Adam Smith thinks mm -hmm. people want. But we need to know what the practice is actually doing and that's the point made in, in broadcast music mm -hmm. by Justice White. There, there was an agreement on price made by the people who joined the blanket license. Mm -hmm. It was not an exclusive. You could contract right. individually for the copyright, for the right, the sync right, mm -hmm. technically. You could contract individually for it, but there was an agreement on price. The question, as Justice White put it, is what would make us think that this agreement in price has the drawbacks of a cartel, that is, that it's reducing mm -hmm. output and increasing prices to consumers, as opposed to something that is reducing transaction costs and thus mm -hmm. increasing output. And if you don't have a way of getting at that answer, you don't know whether to praise the practice or condemn it or just say, we don't know enough about it, let's scratch our heads and come back in a decade. People say that antitrust is the most cerebral area of the law. Others say that it's given to hyperbole and populist rhetoric. Do you see it that way? It's both. Uh, it is certainly a cerebral area if you're trying to figure out the real economic consequences of a practice. And that can be extremely difficult. On the other hand, as I've mentioned, uh, too many trials are about seeing whether you can find the, the damning memo. Uh, one, while I was a professor of law, I also spent some of my time consulting. Uh, through the firm Lexicon. Mm -hmm. And people who were involved in the antitrust process would hire Lexicon, as Lex E Con, as mm -hmm. in law and economics, uh, to analyze the process and give them an idea. And I vividly recall one case in which Lexicon did an economic analysis and tried to explain it to the lawyer for the defendant. It was a, it's an important case, a very difficult case. After about an hour of this explanation, the lawyer practically exploded with delight. He said, I've got it. I've got it. I've finally got the theory of defense. We're going to say that the plaintiff cheated on his taxes. <laughs> we, were, we were operating on very different levels in that conversation. Uh, and both of those levels... Uh, are unavoidable in litigation, including antitrust litigation. You seem to make a substantial effort to explain things. That's true even in the way you've answered the questions I've been, I've been asking you. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would think it's fair to call you Easterbrook the explainer. Uh, how did that style evolve? Was that something you always did? I think it's absolutely essential, but to the extent I didn't have that style in the, when I was in law school or, or mm -hmm. college, that is the style drilled into people in the Solicitor General's office. It was the style of Dan Friedman, among other things. The, if you're going to file a brief in the Supreme Court and catch the justices' attention, when I was there, they were hearing 180 cases on the merits a year, mm -hmm. plus the zillions of cert petitions that are filed. If you're going to catch their attention, you have to write something that is simple and straightforward and explains why this is important and sums up in a 
easily traceable way why it, it matters. Uh, Bob Bork said when he was Solicitor General, and I think the greatest appellate advocate then living, maybe still, said that the brief had to be so plain that high school students could understand what was going on, in part because of shortage of time, and in part because the justices and judges and most people who read legal documents are generalists rather than specialists. Mm -hmm. Specialists will develop their own lingo and acronyms and, and shorthand, and, and they may not need explanation. But in our legal system, the judges are generalists. Many professors are generalists. And of course, most of the lay audience is a generalist. And you have to write differently for an audience of generalists than you do for an audience of specialists. So I learned to write for an audience of generalists, and it seemed to me uh, that it is still the best way to write. And that applies to all areas of the law, not just antitrust? All of them. All of them. Looking at the Seventh Circuit, uh, is the entire court uh, as antitrust literate and articulate as you are, uh, or Judge Wood and Judge Posner, uh, just how did it happen that there was this concentration of judges on this one court that is very knowledgeable in antitrust? Well, it's a happenstance that three people who used to teach antitrust <laughs> law at the University of Chicago and have their names as authors on antitrust case books and antitrust articles and so on have, have landed uh, at the Seventh mm -hmm. Circuit. But I don't, I don't want to say that we are particularly literate in antitrust as, as a court. I do want to say that it's a court that takes law and takes the responsibility of what they are doing very seriously. Or as Bill Bauer uh, always says, we take our job seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. So we we have a culture at the court in which we engage in a lot of reading, we engage in a lot of talking, uh, and we get something of a leg up by the fact that there are three people who have been involved in, in antitrust, but we get a, a leg up on questions of jurisdiction and conflicts of law by the fact that Judge Ripple, who was then and now on the faculty at Notre Dame, a chip in. Judge Bauer has taught criminal procedure in, as an adjunct in several places. Judge Flom has done that. We're, we're an institution that is, has, takes the life of the mind seriously. Every once in a while, your opinions seem to exhibit some frustration that lawyers just, just don't get it. Uh, and uh, I, I think of particularly the LAPD case where you said finally you know, even though it's not an antitrust case, throw up your hands and say, you know, we've had to remind lawyers more often than not that, that good faith is not just love one another and so forth. Uh, first of all, do you really get frustrated? And secondly, are they ever going to get it? I, I don't know if frustrated is the right word, but there are an awful lot of lawyers who seem to be stuck in the 60s, uh, long before Schwinn was overruled, long before the world of GTE Sylvania and Brunswick mm -hmm. and, and broadcast music pointed out that output is, is very important. I'm, I'm frustrated by the fact that many people, and that this is true of judges, it's true of advocates, it's true of scholars throughout the world, tend to be stuck in whatever intellectual milieu they grew up mm -hmm. in. Uh, and the world may change around them, but many of them don't change. And so we get a lot of arguments uh, in antitrust still that read as if the controlling precedent were Schwinn or Pabst Brewing. Uh, and it, it is a little frustrating that people haven't wised up, but it's also understandable because that's part of the human condition. Let's talk about the 30-year period from 1978 to 2008. Putting aside whether or not you were involved in those cases. What was going on? Since 77, 78, 79, they were the main breaks. Uh, that, as I said earlier, I think the inhospitality tradition was gone by 1979. At that point, the only question is working out how the judicial system can intelligently respond to uh, a a set of rules that is now focused on the well-being of consumers and no longer worries, as, mm 
Justice Peckham said about small dealers and worthy men. Mm -hmm. The small dealers and worthy men have interests of their own, but antitrust is, is about consumers. How one works this out is extremely difficult because wisdom about the effect of practices on consumers generally arrives slower than litigation. People file lawsuits when a practice pinches them. Mm -hmm. Often middlemen, often competitors, sometimes consumers. It's, it's easy for the plaintiffs to perceive the pinch, but the pinch may be coming from something that injures consumers or it may be coming from the very competitive forces that help consumers. The question is, can you sort things out in litigation? Uh, by and large, litigation is, lawyers think of litigation as too slow, but mm -hmm. it's, it comes faster than a detailed academic study of the industry. So is it then possible to create legal rules that work tolerably well in a world where we may not know the real answer to the question till later? Well, one of the things that broadcast music emphasized, and then Justice Stevens emphasized in the NCAA case where the Supreme Court adopted the quick look version of the rule of reason, is that it's necessary to have simplifying rules. The, the rule of reason used to be before 1984, before the NCAA case, in which, by the way, I represented the NCAA. So I represented the losing party, but one may think that the intellectual approach of antitrust was the winning party <laughs> in that case. In, before then, people thought of the rule of reason as this giant stew pot in which you threw everything in, motives, opportunities, beliefs, wishes, you, you name it. After 1984, the rule of reason is much simplified. We're now looking at effect on output. Uh, after that case and after Jefferson Parish against Hyde uh, effectively restores the, top, the world of tie-ins to the rule of reason by inserting a market power requirement, mm -hmm. we now have a series of filters. I actually argued, used the word filters in an article I wrote back in 84 called The Limits of Antitrust, mm -hmm. suggesting that we can simplify by looking for market power. If there's no market power, just take everything else out. There's no, nothing bad going to happen. By looking to see whether the plaintiffs, sorry, whether the, the defendant's conduct helps them buy something that injures consumers. There are a lot of things that injure consumers but, but don't help the defendants. I mean, think, for example, of introducing unsuccessful products. The, the Edsel probably injured consumers, but it injured Ford, too, uh, and so you don't need the antitrust law to, to get rid of that. And much of this, much of antitrust law has been about the process of simplification. I'll give you one more example where the Supreme Court has done something that I've advocated as a scholar about predatory pricing. Predatory pricing might drive firms out and end up with higher prices for consumers, or it might just drive prices down and leave them down, then consumers are, mm -hmm. are unambiguous beneficiaries. Well, how do you tell? The answer is you can't tell while the practice is going on. So look at the end state. Ask whether the predator, the would-be monopolist, mm -hmm. can recoup. If the predator can recoup, then you're worried. If there's never going to be a recoupment period, then you're not worried. It's another simplifying approach. Uh, and in the Matsushita case, the Japanese electronics antitrust case, the Supreme Court adopted that view. Look for the possibility of recoupment. And it's taken that view since in Brook Group and Weyerhaeuser and, and mm -hmm. another series of cases. So that, I think, has been the working out of the last 30 years, has been looking for filters, for simplifying rules, mm -hmm. for things that judges plausibly can do uh, and which are likely to do more good than harm. The cases you're mentioning are big cases. Is that because antitrust involves big cases and cases have to be big? Or are there smaller cases that are important? I, I'm inclined to think that there are very few cases that are born big. Maybe no cases are born big. Let me take you back to broadcast music. There were lots of ways that Justice White could have written the opinion in broadcast music, even when the Supreme Court agreed to reverse. Some of those ways would have been terminally boring. Uh, in fact, he wrote it in a way that broke the back of a 70-year-long tradition in antitrust. 
it it wasn't because of what the advocates put in that the the thing came out one way rather than another. You know, I I participated in that case as a lawyer for the United States, participating as amicus curiae on behalf of the defendants. And you could tell something about the change, by the way, in the, in the nature of antitrust law. This was during the administration of President Carter. The head of the antitrust division uh, was busy prosecuting vertical restraints on trade. Mm-hmm. And yet, President Carter's Department of Justice and his antitrust division supported the defendants in broadcast music because they couldn't see how this was injuring consumers. You, you can tell the world has changed when a relatively liberal democratic administration is supporting the defendants in a case like broadcast music rather than, rather than prosecuting them. But we tried in, the, in that amicus brief to explain why a practice like this might be beneficial. And the judge then could write the opinion in multiple ways. He could write it and again, I'm assuming that all the justices want to reverse. You can write an opinion that says, we can imagine ways in which this practice could be beneficial. Let's now have a very open-ended trial. Or you could write it in a way which uh, the, the court did, which re-rationalized the nature of per se rules in antitrust. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not something that's within the control of an advocate. So I think big cases are big not in prospect, but in retrospect. I think this leads naturally to another topic. We understand cartel behavior as an important focus of antitrust laws because it reduces output and because it raises price. We understand our concern about the exercise of market power in horizontal mergers. But when it comes to vertical relationships, shouldn't we all be puzzled by the ongoing concern about vertical antitrust where there is little or no output reduction? and where strategies may ultimately lead to output increasing developments that help consumers. How can we cure this problem? Well, other than ask the Supreme Court to decide the Ligon case again, uh, the, you know, now that the per se rule of Dr. Miles is gone, uh, the, any remaining practices can be subject to justification. That more likely, the better way to put that is, they can come out into the open. With a per se rule, people tend to hide what they're doing. Uh, when the per se rule is replaced by a structured rule of reason, the sort of quick look version of the rule of reason with a market power filter, mm-hmm. people will then bring their practices out from hiding and one can study them, try to figure out academically what they're doing, try to figure out in litigation what they're doing. But when you say, are these vertical cases going to go away, my immediate reaction is, they have gone away. They are, they're dead. And they aren't dead because of Ligon. They're dead for reasons you suggested, which is that there's been great economic changes in the way in which distribution occurs. Some of it is related to the fact that transportation is much cheaper, so the old vertical territories, by and large, have have passed away. Uh, communication is so much cheaper. I mean, how do vertical territories get sustained when people can go shop on the internet? Many of the old justifications for vertical restrictions, that is, you're, the manufacturer is setting up somebody who can provide point-of-sale services, information that you would not mm-hmm. otherwise get. There are now much cheaper ways of providing the information. You go to the manufacturer's website and look it up, or you look it up on consumer reports and so on. So with, with large economic changes in transportation, information technology, and so on, you'd expect major changes in distribution. With changes in distribution, it affects how much litigation there is. When I joined the Court of Appeals in 1985, I would say I saw three or four vertical restriction cases a year. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm only, I'm on about a quarter of the panels that the court mm-hmm. hears. Our court has 11 full-time members, and with senior judges, we're an effective size of about 12. We sit in panels of three, so I'm on one out of every four cases, roughly. And if I was seeing four or five of these cases a year, so the court was seeing 20 or so a year. Now, and this is even before Ligon, I would say the Seventh Circuit as an institution sees maybe one vertical restrictions case a year. Maybe one. 
maybe zero. Mm -hmm. So the underlying economic practice has changed, the amount of litigation has changed, and that's completely independent of cases like Ligon. What do you say to the lawyer who approaches antitrust as a, as a civil right, that is arguing that my client has a right to carry products, uh, and if they don't, that's an antitrust violation? Well, I, I would suggest this person go back and read not only Ligon, but also GTE Sylvania and many other cases, Aronson against Quick Point Pencil Company. Mm -hmm. the lawyers advocating for their clients ask, what will increase my client's welfare? But the purpose of the antitrust law is not to protect small dealers and worthy men, but to protect consumers. And Joseph Schumpeter once said, a wonderful phrase, that competition is a gale of creative destruction. The existing players in a competitive economy are at each other's throats and destroying each other by producing better products and lower prices. Consumers are the big winners, but nobody likes to be destroyed. Nobody likes to have the hurricane blow him away. And so he will file lawsuits, he'll do what he can in the market. It's, it's a perfectly understandable impulse, but the antitrust laws are not about that. The antitrust laws encourage the practice that turns the screws on individual competitors, mm -hmm. the better to help consumers. So it's not, it's not about the civil rights or the any other rights of the producers. It's about the rights of their customers. We refer to antitrust law as, as, as a living tree that it's informed by precedent, but uh, it is uh, also guided by the uh, knowledge and developing wisdom of economists and the academic world, and hopefully lawyers also. Uh, do you agree with that approach? Is that where antitrust law is heading? Doesn't that mean that we've, we've wiped out reliance on precedent? No, this, this is definitely the way it should be done. And anybody who likes markets should really love the common law system because the common law system uh, is a bottom-up system. It's a system that arises from thousands of interactions among lawyers and judges and clients rather than a top-down system, mm -hmm. a system in which you take what uh, some of our friends in Europe are doing of, of devising many rules through the European Commission in Brussels, a top-down system. The top-down system is much more likely to make mistakes. It's a form of central planning. And the common law is the opposite of central planning. It's a market-based system. I mean, most lawyers don't think of the law as arising from markets, but it, but it does. This extended interaction among clients and lawyers and judges is a market system for producing law. Now, this is one of the central insights of my colleague Richard Posner's economic analysis of law. He began by, by thinking about tort law mm -hmm. and about contract law that way. But I think it's also true of antitrust law and securities law and the more explicit systems where there is a common law dimension. The statutes, on the other hand, or central directives of the European Commission, are much more likely to be the result of clashes among interest groups. Mm -hmm. It's much easier for an interest group that wants protection from competition to get the ear of a subcommittee in Congress and to get legislation than it is for them to get control of this very sprawling and cumbersome mm -hmm. and difficult to, to compass system by which the common law is produced. So we might expect laws there to be more interest-seeking private interest seeking features mm -hmm. of statutes and more public interest features of common law. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm perfectly delighted by a common law approach. Well, and what you're saying is very exciting uh, and, and, and energizing, but is it beyond the capabilities of ordinary judges and ordinary lawyers? Absolutely. And that's another reason why we should like the common law. Because one of the things the common law does for you, this slow process, is the legal system as a whole is impounding more wisdom than any single person can bring to the dispute. If somebody asked me, and, and I've been a specialist in antitrust law and a few other fields, if somebody asked me to sit down and, and recreate antitrust law now, could I do better than where we are? I, th I think the answer is no. And I would do it 
not be able to do it in part because any one person's contribution is very limited, and in part because every time somebody sits down and comes up with a bright new idea, bright new idea is likely to be a blunder. It's like, like most mutations in biology. When your DNA reassembles itself to do something new, most of the time that's not a survival feature. All right? Some mutations have survival value, but most don't. And I think that's true of most bright ideas in law and bright ideas in the economy. You, you want a system in which people don't, by having their bright ideas, uh, fix something that can be an error. So the system as a whole has got much more wisdom in it than any one person uh, brings to it. So I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea that coming up with a set of rules of competition is beyond the, the power of mortal man, but not necessarily beyond the power of a large system that's got lots of people's wisdom in it. How does Twombly figure into all of this if it does? Uh, I, I view Twombly as reflecting an error by the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the Second Circuit had adopted a, an approach to conscious parallelism that, that might violate the antitrust law uh, that was enormously complex and not administrable by anybody, would have extremely expensive discovery and that followed by a random decision. Hmm. And that the Second Circuit wrote an opinion that was, what, 80 pages long and not readable by any human being. Uh, and the Supreme Court grants certiorari because they knew this was terrible. Uh, and other courts weren't taking that approach to conscious parallelism. And then the case gets to the Supreme Court and they realize, oh my goodness, this was dismissed on the complaint stage, or, and then it was reversed. So we now have to talk about the rules for dismissing complaints rather than just substantive antitrust doctrine. I, I think they didn't really realize what they were getting into, what stage it was. Uh, and so they then wrote a long opinion about the rules for dismissing complaints, which, as Justice Stevens said in his dissent, was not the best way to understand Rule 12b-6. I don't expect Twombly to affect the rules, and neither do the justices, because two weeks after Twombly, they summarily reversed a decision that had dismissed a complaint for failing to plead facts. And they, in this summary reversal, they say roughly, you know what we said in Twombly? Well, don't generalize from it. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about foreign regimes. Uh, looking at the antitrust regimes of the EU and China and Japan, uh, have you seen any form of harmonization between those regimes? And do you think that would be a good idea? When somebody says the word harmonization to me, I hear the word cartel. <laughs> we do not want to agree with the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese about these principles because most likely, as soon as we start entering into harmonization, we're now in the world of statutes and treaties where interest groups will have their way mm -hmm. and they will most likely end up protecting the competitors because the competitors are the ones who have the largest stake in, in statutes at the expense of consumers. So I'm not in favor of harmonization. The less mm -hmm. harmony we have and the more competition we have, the happier I am. But I'm, I'm also worried, just as somebody who, like everybody else, buys a lot of his goods that are made in Europe or Japan or China, and I'm, I don't want to see them adopting rules that are unfortunate. Uh, but it does seem from some of the things coming out of Brussels that they are determined that they will learn about all of America's errors for themselves. <laughs> Instead of skipping some of the errors we made, they'll, they will repeat them. Uh, fulfilling Santayana's line that those who fail to learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. Do we extend that analysis also to federal state enforcement strategies and antitrust? I'm, I'm not so much interested in uh, harmonizing enforcement strategies as I am worried about the squeaky wheel phenomenon and mm -hmm. and again worried about about interest groups uh, it, it is a lot easier for an interest group you know the competitors of some big mm -hmm. firm uh, 
to win influence with one attorney general than it is to win influence with the attorney general of the United States or the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and for many interstate practices, uh, you, you have to be able to operate in all 50 states. You can't say, well, I'm sorry, but we're withdrawing our products from Indiana and we'll sell in the other mm -hmm. 49 states, just to name one of the states in the Seventh Circuit. So there is something of a worry. I think much of this worry comes about because American law, unlike most foreign laws, uh, allows private parties to get injunctions as well as damages. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be in favor, I've written about this several times, I would be in favor of a statutory change that says that injunctive relief, equitable prospective relief, can be granted at the behest of the Antitrust mm -hmm. Division and the Federal Trade Commission but only damages are available to state attorneys general and private parties because then you don't have a system in which one holdup can block a nationwide practice. Mm -hmm. What about absolute preemption? Oh, if you're, if you're mm. elected to Congress. No one would ever be so <laughs> foolish as to do that. I'm, I'm skeptical about preemption of this as indeed a preemption of anything else. Mm -hmm not clear why states can't have separate systems if they want. I mean, we adopted a, a constitution under which states can run their own independent systems. Brandeis called it a, a laboratory as if it were the states were a bunch of mice in cages and they'd be uh, tested and if necessarily euthanized at the end to learn something about this experiment. I, I've never thought of it that way. But again, I'm in favor of competition and that competition among different legal systems in the states has got to be by and large for the good, provided that state X can't use some form of law to reach beyond its borders to mm -hmm. control how people are behaving elsewhere. And there, there's some opportunity to do that in antitrust, and that worries me, but one in which the states are regulating behavior within their own borders mm -hmm. looks to me more competitive and, and therefore likely in the long run to be beneficial. One last question. Uh, the impression most of us have of antitrust enforcers over, certainly over the last 30 years, whether we're talking about the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Antitrust Division or the Commissioners of the Federal Trade Commission, is that they have been highly qualified and while not totally apolitical, they have not worked to politicize either regulatory agency. Do, do you see it that way? Well, I, I do share that view. I, it, in part, it's because of what I mentioned when I pointed out that the Carter administration favored mm -hmm. the, the defendants. That everybody has come to accept that antitrust is about consumers' welfare rather than producers' welfare. Uh, but generally, it is much, if you're a, an interest group and you're trying to win protection from somebody else's competition, it is much harder to capture the government of the United States than it is to find a friend in a state attorney mm -hmm. general's office. There, there are 50. Mm -hmm. uh, much harder to capture the big stage, in part because there are so many opponents that are easier to mobilize for the big stage. So it, it's hard to capture there, and it, it's what goes on is much more visible. If, if we had a head of the antitrust division who started, uh, we have not mentioned the Robinson Patent and Price Discrimination Act. If we had a head of the antitrust division who started you know, bringing lots of Robinson Patman cases, uh, there would be so many people who could see the injury that does that mm -hmm. it would quickly go away. Whereas at a single state level, you might actually have remaining price discrimination mm -hmm. prosecutions. And there's also one other thing. <coughs> At the national level, many of the requests to the head of the antitrust division, for example, are buffered by the president. Right? It is, you can't go to the head of the antitrust division and say, do X or we'll cut your budget if you're an interest group or in Congress. Because the budget isn't made just between the antitrust division and them. Uh, the, the president can bounce back and say to the member of the Senate, you, you know, you play with the antitrust division's budget. Uh, the 
the new facility, the new NASA facility in your district will vanish. Right? So there are, there are resources uh, to the whole national government in dealing with these, the political give and take that are much harder to come by at the state level. And I think this protects the antitrust enforcers from politics. It's been a, been a very good development. Anything else you want to add in terms of what people ought to remember about these 30-plus years that uh, you've been practicing law, teaching on the bench? I, I think the history of antitrust, including these last 30 years, has been a testament to individual stupidity and collective wisdom. I mean, many of these practices are beyond the ability of individual people to, to understand. And it's one reason why I've been skeptical my whole life about simple rules and about the, gen, you know, the general rule of reason where we throw everything into a pot and require 12 jurors who are not professional economists by any means to try to figure these things out. So on the one hand, we have these extraordinarily complex and difficult economic practices. On the other hand, we have an institutional need for rules that will protect consumers. And I think we have observed how a common law system can produce greater wisdom collectively than the individual participants possess. And I think that vindicates in a wonderful way uh, some of the great benefits of the way the legal system is structured in the United States. Thank you for uh, your illuminating answers, uh, and I know we will all benefit from it. It's been delightful. Thank you very much.